All right. It is all about setting up our businesses for success. And a lot of us are really good at the, you know, how do I find the right keywords and identifying products and optimizing things. But there's other things we really need to optimize that sometimes we forget about, like structuring our business for success as a business entity and protecting ourselves from things that may not go right or people that may try to copy us. I know that's a, a concern a lot of people have. That's why I'm super excited to have with me here today someone who is not only a seller and has experience as a seller, but also is a lawyer who can tell us all about the things we should do to protect ourselves um, with all these legal matters. Because the nice thing is, my guest today, he not only, as I said, is a lawyer, but he's lived this as a seller as well, and he helps sellers. So I'm super excited to have with me here today from Wright Law Office, Robert Wright. Hey, Kevin, Kevin, I appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Please don't hold the uh, lawyer thing against me. Um, you know, it, it, it's a great thing, but it's also, you know, sometimes people are like, ah, the lawyers, we need to, we need to get rid of them all, but we don't because lawyers will help your business uh, if you, if you, if you use them correctly. So I'm glad to be here and certainly uh, happy to talk to everybody in your audience. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Th so, um, Let's just, just so everyone has a better understanding of your background, can you just kind of walk through your background in, I guess, law? Yeah, sure. Selling. Sure thing. Like it's, it's a, it's a, what's the Grateful Dead quote? What a long, strange trip it's been. Like it's, it's been quite an interesting journey. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning as a kid thinking that they're going to do what I call private label law, but that's, that's where right. I ended up. Um, I've always geeked out about intellectual property. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, I was, I was kind of coming of age and, you know, getting out of college and moving into law school at the, in what I call the heyday of the internet, when it was really starting to become what it is. You know, you had Napster for the first time and the ability to share files. And uh, I admittedly was, was sharing a lot of music with friends uh, at that time and was really, really upset when the recording companies kind of came in and shut all that down. It just didn't seem fair, right? Like they tell you day one of kindergarten that you're supposed to share with your friends and all of a sudden that that's not right, right? You know, you're, you're, you know, people are, the accounts are being shut down, letters are being sent, lawsuits are being filed. And so as I went into law school, I was really interested in the why behind all of that. Like, you know, why can't you share music online? And that led me down a path of, of exploring intellectual property, right? So that's, that's basic copyright law. And when we talk about file sharing and then, you know, that, that segued into trademark law and patent law and e-commerce centric sorts of laws and just got hyper interested in that. And so as I, you know, left law school and kind of wanted to hang my shingle, I really wanted to, I wanted to practice that area of law, I wanted to practice intellectual property, but specifically I wanted to support entrepreneurs. You know, to me, it seemed like the traditional legal paradigm was you had two options. You kind of had the big law firm that you had to go to, you know, get the car, go downtown, wait in the lobby, go behind, you know, go to the, the you know, partner's office and pay a ridiculous fee you know, for services, or you had kind of this do it yourself sort of legal thing, you know, like legal zoom or trademark or, or whatnot, lots of really great services, but you know, you're kind of on your own. I wanted to bridge the gap in between the two and kind of take, you know, the actual legal, um, uh, expertise, quote unquote, I can't claim to be an expert, but legal services and plug it into kind of an online platform and, and, uh, and meet, meet the two in the middle. Uh, and so launched the practice and that was great, uh, great response and, and would have people coming in, you know, my virtual doors, cause I, I don't have a brick and mortar, I'm a virtual law office. Um, and they would ask me like, Hey, can you look at this contract or Hey, can you file this trademark? Hey, I need to, I think I need to register a copyright. Can you tell me more about that? But then all of a sudden one day it really changed and in, I'll never forget the moment. It was a, it was a Facebook uh, message from a friend and it, it said, you know, I've, I've been hijacked. Can you help? And, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, you've been hijacked. Like, is everything okay? Like, what's going <laughs> on? Like, do I need to call the cops? Like, what, what is this? Right. Right? They're terrorists. And, and it, no, it really, I mean, it was, it was really disturbing. I'm not making light of it because I'm like, I don't, this, this sounds awful. Right. Um, and, and the, you know, they reached out. They're like, no, it's not like that. My, my listing's been hijacked. And I'm like, your listing's been hijacked. What is, what is that all about? And so, you know, he started talking to me about private label selling and Amazon and FBA and, and that really just opened my eyes towards this whole new world of 
you know, I mean, Amazon is, was, was becoming the biggest mall in the world. You know, it, it, it just, and people were selling all sorts of stuff on it. Um, and interestingly enough, pretty soon, instead of people coming through my virtual doors, talking about trademarks or talking about copyrights, it was hijacking and brand registry and brand gating. And someone took the buy box. Can you help me? It was all this really Amazon specific nomenclature that made me think, um, I need to help these folks, right? Like I can talk all the day about trademarks and copyrights and patents and terms of service and all those sorts of things. But for me to really understand what it feels like to be hijacked and why it matters if the buy box is gone, I need to walk in their shoes. And so it was, it was at that point that I said, okay, I want to learn how to do, I want to learn how to sell on Amazon. And so I went out and found mentors. I went out and enrolled in courses and, and, you know, launched my own private label brand. So I sell both in the States and throughout Europe uh, with a couple of different brands um, and have been doing that for the last couple of years. And it's been, it's been a win-win in that it's a nice stream of income for me, but it's also supportive of the law practice in that when people do come to my doors and, you know, with those problems uh, or, you know, they request, Hey, I want to get brand registered. I know exactly why they want to do that. Cause, cause I've, I've experienced it myself. Like I've had people hijack my listings and I've had to deal with that. Um, you know, the brand registry process and getting enhanced brand content, I understand the value of that. And so it's just been able to put me in a kind of a unique position to support my clients in a better way. So that's kind of, you know, and because of that, and I just like private label sellers and, and e-commerce sellers um, really just even niche down the practice a little bit further. And I would say a good 90% of my client base these days are people selling online, which is cool. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the fun thing is that, you know, this whole Amazon world opened up, you know, all kinds of doors for, I, I like your analogy of like, it's almost like the world's largest mall. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I remember as a teenager or whatever, when mall of America came out in Minnesota and everyone was like, Oh wow, this mall is huge. Yeah. Um, but Amazon really is like that times many more, but we don't always think about that. And one of the interesting things is, is that it can be fairly easy to get into because as we were talking offline, you know, you don't have to sign a lease to no. start a business. You don't have to invest $50,000 in inventory or put down a hundred thousand dollar franchise fee or something like that. You can just kind of start. You can just start it. it it's yeah. amazing. It's, you know, the internet is, is to me, it's that great equalizer, right? Like, and it is completely level the playing field for people that want to get into business. I mean, I remember, you know, just as a kid, I guess I've, I've always naturally, you know, kind of had a little bit of an entrepreneurial itch. Uh, but I remember like, you know, being at like a, uh, uh, like a drugstore or whatever, and you see a magazine rack, there was always that one magazine. It was like how to start a business. And it just, it was basically like a catalog of franchises that you could start and you just flip through it. And, and it would kind of, you know, you need to invest, you know, minimum investment, $50,000, minimum investment, a million dollars, have to have this much money in the bank. And it was almost like a barrier to entry. Like you, you had to go get a loan. You had to reach out to family members to kind of collect money and say, okay, do I have enough money to start this subway franchise or to start this whatever franchise? You don't have to do that with, you know, an online business. You don't have to do that with Amazon. It's literally, it was like 40 bucks a month. You create an account and boom, you're ready to go. And I was, I was, I, it's funny. We're, we're, I was thinking about this in another context, but you know, even back in the old days of if you wanted to do a little bit of a side hustle and you needed a little bit of extra cash, you'd have a yard sale, right? You would literally go around your house mm. and collect all the stuff that you didn't want. And then you'd, you know, post a newspaper advertisement or you know, put signs out in front of the subdivision. And then you'd, you know, Saturday morning, you roll out all your stuff onto the driveway. There's now an app for that. Like we were trying right. to get some junk the other day and literally I can take my phone, snap a picture of some, you know, computer thing I don't need anymore Post it on, you know, Facebook, uh, you know, marketplace or, uh, you know, there's like three or four Craigslist. different Yeah. Like Craigslist, boom. And like, you know, within 10 minutes, people are saying, Hey, I'll give you 20 bucks for that. Like right. technology is this amazing equalizer. It's never been easier to start a business. It doesn't have to be an Amazon business. It literally it just be you running around your house with your phone, snapping pictures of things you don't want uh, and turning that into cash. I mean, that's, it's a really cool thing. It's a, it sounds cliche, but like it's a really great time to be alive for that reason. Because if you have 
the uh, if you have the ability you know, you, I mean you need an internet connection and you have a little bit of drive like you can make money online it's cool yeah exactly and it's created this whole new world um, like for example you know there's there's events which you know you'll be a sponsor of uh, uh, brand accelerator live coming up here in September um, yeah. should be right around the time this airs but for anyone listening to this after the fact, um, you know, they can always sign up for the next year's event. Yes. You know, if, year if it's well. after September. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But you know, the thing of it is, is sometimes when there's this, you know, to your point, it's a great time to be alive. You know, you mm -hmm. hear all this stuff in the world, people focus on the negative, but if you focus on the positive, there's so yeah. much opportunity. Now Absolutely. there's also a double-edged sword with that because there's a lot of opportunity for everyone who's willing to go after it. But there's also a lot of opportunity for everyone that's willing to go after it. So if it's easy for you, it's easy for other people. So in a grand scheme, a grand scheme is probably the wrong word, in the, in the big picture, I should say, um, mm -hmm. what is like if someone were to start off today, because I know a lot of people listening to this have already started, but yeah. theoretically, what is that ideal that someone, if they were starting today, what should they do from a legal standpoint to protect themselves, intellectual property, liability, and all that fun stuff. All, all that sort of stuff. No, that's, that's a good question. And you know, the thing is, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be overly complicated. I think a lot of people, when it comes to the law, I kind of joked about you know, the lawyer thing at, at the top of the, of the podcast, right. but, but I think lawyers do get a little bit of a bad rap because we run around scaring people, right? Like we tell them, you know, we're just naturally trained to kind of talk about all the bad things that can happen. And it's not because we're negative people, but I think it's just that we generally have our eyes a little wider open than most do just because we've, we've, you know, we've, you know, we've, that's how we're trained. That's what we do. That's how we see the world. Um, but, the, and, and because of that, I think people just get scared of the law. And I think they either just want to put their head in the sand and ignore it or they just kind of want to not look under the bed. They know that there's something lurking and they just don't want to check it out. And, you know, it'll just go away. Maybe not, none of that stuff happens, especially with business. You know, the, the thing about business is you grow and scale and you get, you get bigger and better, which is what everybody wants, right? We all want to make more money so that we can, you know, sell more products or sell more you know, services or do whatever. And, and just, you know, have the lifestyle that we're all looking for, right? Like you've got to, you've got to grow to do that. As soon as you do that, you're going to get on the radar and other people are going to look at your success and start copying it. Because like you said, if it's easy for you to do, it's going to be easy for somebody else. And if you've already kind of forged that path, well, guess what? Like it's even, it's even easier on top of already easy. Um, so if I were, if I were starting a new, right, like to me, the first course of business is I have to, you need to be operating through some sort of formal business entity. Uh, and when I say that, I'm talking like a limited liability company or a corporation. Now, you know, if it's if it's a you know you and your business, if it's a couple of people, you and a partner or two in your business, and you know, that just because it's a relaxed nature, it's just a handful of good friends working together. That doesn't mean that you don't need some formal structure, right? A lot of times, I have clients that you know they'll come to me. And they, they just started hustling. They just got busy. They just started doing, right? They were taking action. And then they got so far down the path that they realized, oh, wait a minute, like I'm totally exposed because I'm just running this as a sole proprietor or I'm just running this as a partnership. And now that my partner wants to leave and like, what do I do? Because we don't have an agreement, but we were good friends and we thought we were going to do this forever. And now, you know, that's not happening, right? So to me, like, Step number one of any business, whether it's, you know, Amazon, whether it's eBay, whether it's info products, whether it's, you know, just consulting services is operate through a formal business entity. A limited liability company is very easy to form. It is very easy to operate. It is very easy to keep running. Um, you know, it, it is it is the best of both worlds. Limited liability companies were actually a cool thing. They were kind of a cre creature. Uh, creature a creation of the late 1970s. And they were, they were um, spurred on by states. So states were trying to figure out like, how can, we, how can we spur entrepreneurship? How can we foster innovation? And prior to the, or the formation of the limited, the creation of the limited liability company, you really had the option of just being a sole proprietor, which means all your personal assets are risk as you go to market. 
You could be a partnership if you were working with someone. And again, you were fully liable for anything that that partnership would do, or you could choose to incorporate, which required, you know, formal paperwork being filed with the secretary of state. You got to set up a board of directors. You got to have a CEO, you're issuing shares. And for small businesses, you know, one or two person operations, like that was just a lot. Like it was too much. Right. And so because of that, the people, you know, like a lot of folks probably listening to the, in the audience, they, they might just decide, I don't want to get in it. Maybe that's not such a good idea because I just don't want to deal with any of that stuff. I'll just keep doing whatever I'm doing and not, you know, start a business. To solve this, states said, okay, what if we could give the best of both worlds? What if we could give like the ease of creation of just a sole proprietorship or a partnership, which is created when you just start doing business, right? I mean, you don't have to file anything. What if we did you know, gave the ease of that with kind of the advantages of a corporate structure, which takes your personal assets and removes them from the field of play. It basically creates a shield around your personal bank account, your house, your car, your boat, like whatever you own personally, that all goes off to the side, right? And, and you know, it's, it's this nice little veil of protection. So the only assets that you ever have at risk as a, as a corporation are the assets of the corporation. All right, so it's states were like, well, how do, we, how do we solve for this? How can we take the benefits of a corporation with the ease of a sole proprietorship or a partnership? And they came up with a limited liability company. So you do, for it to organize a limited liability company, you have to file some paperwork with the Secretary of State. And then that's really about it. I mean, you should have an operating agreement. You should have a registered agent. But, but it's a, you know, there's no shares there's no board meetings. There's no annual anything. I mean, it's literally, you get all of the benefits of a corporation. You even get some of the tax benefits if you want to get into that of like, do I want to be taxed as a corporation or as a sole proprietor or a partnership? You get that too. You get the personal asset protection, but really with the ease of running a sole proprietor or a partnership. So right out of the gate, run your business through some sort of formal business entity. My recommendation is always the limited liability company. Just for most folks, that makes the most sense because of the administrative ease. Um, but, you know, the corporation is also an option as well. And, and I say that because, again, when you're doing business, uh, you know, pe people are going to come after you. It might be competitors. It might be your customers. It might be Amazon, the platform. But, I mean, if some product that you sold accidentally hurt somebody, you know, there's a lot of lawyers out there that are going to be looking to, to, to sue, right? Like day one, class one of law school, it's sue everybody for everything. That's what they teach you. Like, and so that's, that's how we're all trained. Because of that, you want to make sure that all of your personal assets are removed from the field of play. Only your business asset, assets are ever at stake. And you do that by operating through a limited liability company or a corporation. Gotcha. Now, what would you suggest you do from... Okay, so we just talked about how to protect your personal, personal assets. Yeah. But how do you protect like the business's assets of like the, the intellectual right. property, we'll call the it. Intellectual property. Well, that's where we, we start talking about copyrights, trademarks, and patents. All right. Anything, and I think a lot of people get really confused with intellectual property. They think, oh, I'm yeah, what is it even property? Yeah, but it, what does it mean? Like intellectual property actually doesn't mean anything in and of itself. There's three different flavors of intellectual property. There's actually it's four, uh, but the fourth one's kind of the black sheep of the IP family. There, there are copyrights, there are trademarks, there are patents, and then there are trade secrets. Nobody likes to talk about trade secrets because they're mm. secret. Um, but things like, you know, I'll give you some just quick examples. They're not really applicable to e-commerce, but you know, I think they're fun. So things like uh, the blend of herbs and spices for Kentucky Fried Chicken, protected as a trade secret. Okay. Recipe for Coca-Cola, protected as a trade secret. Bush's baked beans, you know, how they make their beans and the sauce and the recipe again. And now we're all getting hungry because we're talking about food. Right, exactly. I'm hungry. Trade, trade secrets should just be like food law, I guess. Right. Uh, but again, you know, lots of advantages to trade secrets, but, you know, not really generally applicable to e-commerce sellers. So we've, we're left with trademarks, copyrights, and patents. Trademarks protect your brand. When I think about trademarks, I think about Nike because they do, they do branding really, really well. They have Nike, the word mark, right? In any mm -hmm. sort of font style, form, or fashion. They have their iconic swoosh, which is central to the branding. They put it on their shoes and their hats. 
their duffel bags, their t-shirts, you know, their basketballs, all that sort of stuff, which is their design mark. And then they have their tagline or their slogan, just do it, which again is central to their branding. They put it on everything. Each one of those is, is, a, is a trademark. It is meant to identify their goods uh, and distinguish it from everybody else's in the marketplace, right? So as you go out and sell products, you're putting a trademark on there, either you know a, a name like Nike or, a, or a, a word mark or a design mark like the iconic swoosh. Maybe you have a tagline, like all of those different aspects of your brands, uh, brand or trademarkable, and you should be registering them as a trademark. You want to register it as a trademark because unless you do, it could be that you're not going to have rights to sell your product with that branding on it in certain areas of the country. The way that trademark or, uh, rights work, as soon as you put a mark on a product and you start to sell it, you have rights in the geographic area where you're selling. So in the old days of brick and mortar, it was easy enough to kind of say, okay, you have a store in Louisville, Kentucky, and about 50 miles around that, people are coming to the store, they know your mark, they know your brand, you have rights within a 50 mile radius of Louisville, Kentucky. But with e-commerce, we sell everywhere, but we don't really sell anywhere. Like I've looked at some of my, my own Amazon sales and like, you know, I'll sell two you know, products in Idaho for whatever reason, right? But California is gangbusters for me. Michigan people love my stuff. In Florida, you know, I've got a handful of sales. I'm everywhere, but like, do I have rights in Idaho because I've sold two products last week? Like, I don't know. That seems pretty weak to me. So to eliminate all of that, we want to register our trademark with the Patent and Trademark Office. And all of a sudden, those questions get thrown off the board. When we register our mark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, we have the entire United States as our geographic sphere of influence, which means no one can use the same mark or a similar mark on goods or services that are sort of similar to ours, right? So to lock down our brand, we want to make sure that we've registered our trademark. The scariest, worst situation I've seen around this is someone who they were doing everything right. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, they were, they'd sourced a product, they branded a product, they're selling a product. I mean, they're moving up the charts, BSRs, you know, well within the, the thousand range in home and kitchen. But finally, you know, tragedy hit, right? Like someone came in, took the buy box from them, stole their listing, mm -hmm. and they're, they're bleeding money. They're losing sales. They can't, you know, they've got to get the buy box back, right? So they're talking to me and they say, well, how, what do we do? And I'm like, well, are your brand registered? And they're like, no, we haven't registered our trademark. I'm like, okay, well, let's look into that. We need to do that very quickly, in fact. And as I went out and did a clearance search on this, this person's trademark, someone had already registered eff effectively like the exact same mark on the exact same product that she was selling. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there's no way she's gonna be able to get a trademark registration through which means there's no way she's gonna be able to get brand registry, which means she's either gonna to have to try to negotiate some sort of agreement with this other trademark holder and hope that she can get an application through mm. or do a full on rebrand. So she's basically built like five years worth of, of sales. Oh, wow. and now she's gonna to have to start from scratch in many respects because she didn't clear her branding first. She didn't register a trademark first. And again, it's not necessarily one of those things you do day one, but it should be pretty early on in terms of, 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 your, of your radar of things to be thinking about. So registering your trademark, super, super important, and it protects your brand. Gotcha. So there, and, and this is probably a basic question, but for a lot of people listening, they may not necessarily know this because this is stuff I've learned along the way. Yeah. What's the difference between the R circle and the TM. Uh, and the TM, sure, sure, sure. So no, it's a great question and it's not a basic question. The, so the TM, kind of like I told you, um, trademark rights arise upon use. So as soon mm -hmm. as you go to market with a product, you have trademark rights, but it's in that geographic area where you gotcha. sell. Mm -hmm. That TM denotes that they're caught, that person is claiming what are called common law trademark rights, those geographic rights in the regions that they sell. If you see the circle R, that means that someone has actually registered that trademark. So you could go to the USPTO.gov uh, and, and search that, that mark and find the registration certificate. So and do not use the circle R unless you actually are registered because you can get into big trouble. So we, we don't want gotcha. to do it. We like, we like to avoid trouble. 
Now, does that mean your application's on file or the, like they literally have published it? And registered. It. Published it and approved it all the way. It's got to go all the way through. You've got to have a nice registration certificate hanging on the wall uh, before you can use that circle R. Anything at okay. that point, uh, superscript TM. Gotcha. Okay. So you can use the circle R. And so I, I, I have a, my own personal situation mm -hmm. where I ended up being registered the first time I registered a trademark mm -hmm. on the supplemental register. And then I okay. found out there was also a difference in the principal register. Uh, Brand yes. registry at Amazon, they want you to be on the principal register. Yes. Do you mind explaining real quick the difference between the differences the between the two? Sure. Because you can use the circle R either way. So what, what's the yeah, difference? Yeah. Why no, does like, Amazon care? So <laughs> it's a great question. And a lot of people don't understand the difference between the principal register and the supplemental. I think of it almost as I'm a baseball fan and it's, and it's kind of sort of baseball. Well, it is baseball season. And by the time this is broadcast, it'll we'll be heading into the playoffs because baseball season just keeps expanding. Um, I think about the registers as kind of the major leagues and the minor leagues, right? So the principal register is like the major leagues. It's the show. It's where, you know, real trademarks go to be registered and enforced, right? Everybody wants to be on the principal register. Mm. Um, the supplemental is where trademarks go that need a little bit more seasoning. It's kind of like the minor leagues, right? Like as a player in the minors, you've got a lot of skills, you've got a lot of good things going for you, but you just need a little bit more time to, before mm -hmm. you're ready for the show, Right. That's the supplemental register. Typically, marks that end up on the supplemental register, they end up there because they're either uh, they're, they're descriptive of the good or the service that's being associated with the mark. And by its very nature, a trademark can't function as a trademark if it describes the product, right? In order for a trademark to work, it's got to be, it really should be suggestive. At a minimum, it should be suggestive of the product or the service but hopefully the best trademarks are those that are arbitrary, they're fanciful, it's a coined term, it's, some, it's, a, it's a word, it's a phrase that doesn't mean anything until you fill it with the meaning of your brand, okay? Marks that are descriptive can be registered, but they require what's called secondary meaning. This is effectively, um, it's, it's basically goodwill built up, up around the brand that even though the mark on its face is descriptive. It doesn't, you know, distinguish necessarily your products from everybody else's. It just kind of describes what you've got going on with your product. Mm -hmm. Despite that fact, everybody knows that it's a brand name and they recognize it as such. So typically what will happen is when you file a trademark registration, that's descriptive. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll go through examination and examining attorney will say, mm, we think this is descriptive. You can fight us on it, or you can go to the supplemental register. The advantage of going to the supplemental register is that you still get to use the circle R, right? And there's a lot of value in that because it scares people off. You know, if people see a brand name with a circle R, more than likely they're not going to investigate. Well, is this registered on the principal register or the supplemental register? They're just going to kind of steer the other way. Um, it is a registration certificate. I mean, so there is some asset that's created in your business. Um, and it also, it'll, once you sit on the supplemental for so long, it's almost evidence of that sort of goodwill that I've talked about being required mm -hmm. uh, to, to ultimately be able to move up to the principal register. So it's not, it's certainly not a bad thing at all. Uh, but really it's like with the, everybody wants to be in the majors. No one wants to stay too right, long. Right, right. Um, but, but certainly a good strategy. If you're serious about your brand, if you can't make it on the principal, then get on the supplemental, sit there about five years in, you can then, you know, go back and try to get on the principal register and kind of depending upon what's happened with your brand uh, along the way, like you, you might be able to get it moved through. So. so what would be some examples of descriptive terms? Oh, let me, I'm going to do, well, so I, I can think of a, this one's generic, but it's, it's like aspirin, for example, like is, mm -hmm. is descriptive of the product. I mean, that's technically a generic term. Mm -hmm. Um, let me actually see if I can find some good examples. And wasn't like, and this is kind of a little bit of a tangent, but wasn't aspirin originally a, um, a brand name owned by, I think it was Bayer or something like that, it, but they it was a brand was. name, so it became generic because they didn't protect it correctly. Because they, because they didn't protect it. Yeah. It's actually, it's a legal concept called genericide, uh, which sounds horrible. Right. Um, 
you know, which is, I mean, that's like a terrible thing, but no, it, it truly is. It is, um, it's a problem with trademarks. So like uh, aspirin is an example of a brand name that just was so uh, commonly associated with a product that, that it became generic. Xerox is another uh, genericide uh, related sort of brand. Um, oh, what's the, what's the other one? Uh, 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 I'm blanking. Uh, but there's there's a Kleenex. number of uh, Kleenex is the other one that I was thinking of a Polaroid you know uh, for a photo I mean all of those brands um, have have suffered from uh, genericide in some form or fashion and fight it it's actually interesting that's part of the reason why secret shopper programs are so important for brands so I was a in high school I was a um, a uh, server slash busboy slash host person in a restaurant mm -hmm. and uh, I'll never forget like very early on in my training like the uh, the management team made it a really big deal about secret shoppers and you know if someone comes in and and says they want a coke well we sell pepsi products and make sure to correct them i'm like mm. what's the deal like it's not you know why i mean everybody knows it's just it's cola and some people call it pepsi and some people right call it texas pepsi. everything is coke yeah right no oh no 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 like these larger brands will specifically hire secret shoppers to go out and make sure that that correction is being made because brands like Coca-Cola, brands like Pepsi, you want to make sure that you know those terms don't just kind of get lumped in to mean some sort of brown carbonated uh, cola. Mm -hmm. um, so, so certainly, uh, it's a secret shopping is a is a big deal for sure. Yeah, sure. So, so basically, descriptive terms are ones where it's like there's something and you can correct me if I'm wrong, this is from my own understanding, that like if like you're talking too much about the product, like the product itself, like if you yeah, call so, yourself so the like, shoe company or something. The like shoe that. company, like that, that would be a great example. Like, um, you know, if I sold pool rakes and my brand name was Best Pool Rakes, like that's mm -hmm. a horrible trademark. It describes the product that I'm selling. It's Best Pool Rakes. Um, if, if I, I was sold, Miami Shoe Company or something like that. Yeah, Miami you know, Shoe Company. Graphic or, yeah, it could be. Yeah. So descriptiveness applies not only to the product itself, it could be the, um, and you can actually get into some issues with misdescriptiveness and geographic, geographic descriptiveness. Uh, so there's a lot of nuances as you go and kind of register a trademark and, and come up with a brand name that you need to be mindful of. Um, you know, but like if I, if I, uh, Robert's sock company and I sold socks, like, that would be a horrible trademark because you know it's right. a sock company and it's you know run by Robert. Like that would be that would be terrible. Um, because again, so it's harder it's, to defend. Basically, it's harder to defend. Yeah. Now, could I take Robert's sock company selling socks and you know put you know go to market and just do amazing brand campaigns around it and people would just know Robert's socks are like the absolute best socks in the world and there would be all this consumer awareness. I could do that. And if I had that secondary meaning, if I had that consumer goodwill, um, you know, I could, I could get on the principal register, but right out of the gate as a new brand, I'm not going to be able to do that. That's going to be, that's going to be tough for me. So as I, as I work with clients, I think about trade and I love to work with them early in the branding process, just because you can, it's easier to kind of, you know, not avoid mistakes than it is to kind of correct it after the fact. But you have to think about your branding in two ways. One does my branding actually function as a registrable trademark? Is it arbitrary? Is it fanciful? Is it a coin term? Is it, you know, suggestive of the products as opposed to descriptive or generic, right? Like can this, this branding that I want to go after, can it actually be a registered trademark on the principal register? And then secondly, is it available? Like has someone already taken the exact name or something kind of sort of similar, right? A lot of people, you know, oftentimes like Nike is a, is a good example and it's a famous brand. So there are special rules for famous brands, but some people will say, well, what if I wanted to do Nike with an S like I'll add an S to Nike and you know, that's a new trademark. I can register it. It doesn't work that way. Ultimately, when we look to see whether or not we can use a brand and not get in trouble, we're concerned about, the likelihood of consumer confusion. And so I always think about it in terms of, you know, if a consumer were, were to walk down an aisle in a storefront and see your product with your branding next to the, another product with similar branding, would that consumer think that those two products come from the same source, that they're produced by the same people? And if the answer is yes, 
you're, you're going to be in trouble. You can't use that as a trademark. So as, as, as your audience goes out and thinks about their own branding, yeah, it's, it's kind of a bifurcated process. First, is it, is it protectable? Does it function as a trademark? Is it arbitrary? Is it fanciful? Is it a coin term? Is it suggestive as opposed to descriptive? And then secondly, has it already been registered? Right? Is there, is there anything else out there on the trademark office's database that, that is likely to create confusion? Um, and the cool thing about that, Kevin, all of this stuff is like publicly available. I mean, you can go to uspto.gov. It's a very, it's a very intuitive site, which is great. Um, and you can, you can do searches on your own. You know, now, what I would say is, as you find, as you pull results and you start to get overwhelmed and confused and you're like, okay, wait a minute, I've got 50 marks that got pulled as a part of my search. They all kind of sort of look similar. Some are live, some are dead. Some seem to be registered. Some seem not to be registered yet. What do I do with this? Well, at that point, you probably want to consult with somebody to make sense of it. Um, but absent that, I mean, it's, it's the USPTO.gov. I, I give them huge credit. And it's not just because I'm a trademark attorney, but they go out of their way to, to for, especially for a governmental site, to really educate people on how to use it and to make the tool really accessible. So good on the people at the USPTO.gov. Yes. Well, good for them. So, so basically, if I'm understanding this right, it, theoretically, mm -hmm. beginning, what you should do is register some sort of entity with your state or whatever the appropriate location for you is. For you is, yep. And then also um, register a trademark so that way you can protect your brand name. So those are kind of the two big things. Yeah, those, those are the two big things. So many people including myself, said, I'm just going to get started. Mm -hmm. I've had some pitfalls, my, pitfalls myself along the way in mm -hmm. that I ended up with things like being on the supplemental register. Mm -hmm. I fairly early on did add my LLC. So that part went pretty smoothly. Mm -hmm. But the, it was around the time that Amazon went to uh, brand registry 2.0, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yes. And so basically my because of the name and how it's the name of my uh brand was it ended up going supplemental register which i didn't think was going to be an issue until like a month after they said this is what we're going to do at the uspto because i did this all on legal zoom by myself and i thought oh yeah it's fine I, I read some articles i mean i'm i'm practically a lawyer now yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. So I'm like i'll just do that so then i end up on the supplemental register and what I came to find out was if I had trademarked my, um, my logo, I could have gotten on the principal register, which is what ended up happening. So yeah. now I'm, I'm brand registered and everything, but that was a lot of headache and time and money to then go back and, and fix that. Um, yeah. So for those people that are listening that are like, huh, maybe I didn't register as a business entity or, oh, maybe I need to register my brand and stuff like that. Or they have some other mm -hmm. unraveling, which I'm sure you've seen. What, what are the things you, people should do once they're established and they're running and they're like, I need to kind of like go back in time or at least from this point forward and fix it. So what, what are your suggestions? Kind of fix things. Well, well, the cool thing is, and I think what I would offer up to everybody is that most everything is fixable, right? Like, okay. so you can always organize an LLC and kind of take your business assets that you had and pull them into the LLC. You can take your trademark and okay, let's do the logo instead of the word mark and, and then get through and do brand registry 2.0. I mean, so I'm a big believer in that there's always a solution to a problem. It just might be that, you know, it's kind of messy to, to get there to, to, to where you want to be. Right. Um, so, so if, if you are in a spot where you're pretty far down the path and you're kind of thinking, Ooh, I don't know what I don't know. And maybe I goofed up and maybe I did this first, first things first, whatever you did or didn't do can be solved, right? There's a solution for it. Secondly, I think, you know, I, I kind of have the maxim that if you're serious about your business, you take your business seriously. And so a lot of that is obviously, you know, investing in courses and mentorship and launching a business and getting products live. And, and that's all money well spent, but don't ignore things that are you know, less cool and a little less sexy. So things like getting with a lawyer, you know, to talk about the legalities of, am I set up the right way? Is my brand protected? My product photos, like, do I own those? Like, did I have the right agreement in place for that? 
I mean, any, any lawyer worth their salt can, can be able to give you some guidance on that. Um, don't ignore a CPA, right? Like, I mean, a lot of people, uh, they just kind of, you know, they ignore sales tax or they don't do any sort of tax planning at all. And it's just because, well, I don't want to spend the money on speaking with a CPA. Like real businesses do that. And so right. just as you, as you kind of look at your budget, whatever it is, there needs to be a line item on there for professional guidance, right? It's just as important as, as mentorship or education. It's just as important as, you know, getting, you know, inventory and stock doesn't mean it has to be a huge line item, but it should absolutely, absolutely be a part of the budget. Um, you know, just say that you, instead of you know, having your head in the sand, I, as a business owner, I would rather at least be aware of kind of issues in my business and things that I need to patch and things that I need to fix uh, and then put them on a, a on a to do list to get to, as opposed to just ignoring it. So you know, my my guidance would be number one, everything's pretty fixable. Sometimes the fix is pretty messy, but two, get somebody that can help. You know, find somebody that can do give you some professional guidance. Um, you know, the cool thing about the legal profession, despite you know some of the salt that gets thrown at it, is every bar association that I know has a lawyer referral hotline, which is cool. Like mm. whether it's business matters or whether it's personal matters, like you should be able to call up your local bar association and get a list of lawyers who, you know, depending upon whatever your issue is, you know, be able to speak with them. And generally speaking, the consultations are either free or they're low cost, uh, which is great. And, you know, the, the, the legal profession it aspires to serve people. Uh, I know it doesn't always feel that way, but, but, you know, that mechanism is available for people. And so, you know, if you can't find somebody, uh, you know, that, that, that focuses on e-commerce or whatever, you know, look at your local bar association, pick up the phone, give them a call and ask them, Hey, do you have a lawyer referral line? Cause I, I just have some general questions about my business and, you know, maybe I can get some guidance. So see, you know, get some professional help is what I would say. Yeah. And that's a good point. Like, you know, it's like some people don't want to go to the dentist because deep down inside, they're just afraid the dentist is going to find something. Yeah. Cause maybe they don't, cause they're not looking in their mouth. So they don't know what's really in there. So they don't know if they can trust it or whatever the case is. They don't floss as much as they should. We right, all they don't floss as much yeah. as they should, or they don't do the full two minutes with like an electric toothbrush or they, you know, whatever the case is, there's right. just this fear of going what they're going to find. And so I think sometimes it's that with the legal profession. Yeah. But at the end of the day, both professions have a governing body that's watching over it. You know what yes. I mean? So oh, yeah. you know, there, there's professional ethics in both of them. And to your point, like everything is fixable. It uh -huh. may not be what you necessarily want to hear in the moment, mm -hmm. but it's probably not going to be as bad as what we're making it out it, in our heads. Absolutely. And I think the dentist is a really good analogy, right? Because if you don't go, there's only one way that that's going to end up, right? Like and it, right. it, your teeth are going to fall out, right? right. So it's a matter of, you know, are you going to be able to save them because you went to the dentist or are you just going to let it happen and just kind of hide under the, you know, put your head in the sand and like, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm sure it'll get better. It's not going to get better. Like, right. You know, if you've, if you've got an issue in your business, you know, it doesn't mean that you created it purposefully. It might be something that you intentionally did because you just didn't know what you didn't know, but that issue exists. And if it's, if it's going to negatively impact you, it's just going to get worse if you don't discover it and you don't see it and you don't do something right. about it. So, you know, it's, it's, it sounds cliche, but you know, an ounce of, of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's really true. Like to me, I would rather have peace of mind and be able to sleep well at night knowing what I do know that, Hey, I've got, you know, I've vetted my trademark and, and no one else out there has something that's confusingly similar or, you know what, when I hired that photographer to take those product photos, I got the right agreement in place so that I own the copyright in those photos. Or, you know what, I did a quick patent search and, you know, that product that I'm selling, you know, there was a design patent on it, but it expired two years ago. So I can use that exact same design. Like, you know, knowledge is power and shining a light on things like that. Is, I think it's just good business practice. Mm -hmm. and you just got to have the right people at the table. Um, you know, is it, is it business owner? you wear a lot of hats. I mean, you're, you're, you're managing yourself or, or, you know, people that are working in your company, you're learning the business, you're negotiating with suppliers. 
Um, you're, you're balancing the books, you're keeping the books, you're buying stock. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you have to be doing. Um, but as, as you grow and scale, it's time to take some of those hats off and you really shouldn't be your own lawyer. Like you should have somebody right. to, to come to the table and give you guidance. Uh, same thing, you know, from a tax perspective, same thing from, um, you know, just a mentorship perspective. I mean, you want to get the right people around the right table to help guide you because you, you can't be everything to everyone. And, and you certainly shouldn't be a, your own lawyer. That's a, even, even lawyers aren't their own lawyers. You know, I, you don't right. want me to write your will. I don't do wills. I have my will written. I went and hired a lawyer that does wills. So. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, and I remember in uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Kiyosaki talked about, you know, developing a team of people that are, you know, yeah. the experts on certain things. Like, and kind of like we talked in the beginning, oftentimes because of that side hustle syndrome that, you know, a lot of us are like, I'll just start, which I, I truly am a, a believer of just 100%, start. You just do yeah. it. If you don't, you'll never start. And right, so too many people get to talk, I want to patent something. Yes. It's like, your, your thing's not really probably even patentable. And I remember one time I was watching this interview and Damon John was saying from yeah. Shark Tank that it was the founder yeah. of Fubu, that he's never been able to protect a patent, but he always protects his like trademarks. Yeah. And so that was something that kind of stuck with me. But you know, the, the whole point is talk to someone, consider it that, you know, you're, you're, as you grow and develop as a business owner, find your team of people as Robert Kiyosaki yes. says, yeah. or as, Grant Cardone says, people don't cost you money yeah. because it, something else could cost you money. Like the lady who went five years and now all of a sudden she has to rebrand herself. Well, I do. Yeah, no, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny and I, and I do, I, and I, I, I'm not knocking, you know, what I kind of call side hustle syndrome, which is just, you're just getting started and then, you know, it, running yeah. fast things or whatever like that's absolutely what you should do because if you don't do that you're never going to get started when i i have clients all the time as, as we're working on brand names they're paralyzed i mean they're literally paralyzed by fear of well it's got to be a perfect brand name and it's got to right. be the essence of this and it's got to do that and it's a, i will literally give them 15 minutes and say you have 15 minutes to come up with a brand name and right you know, come up with just set the clock choose the name that you like the best We'll run off, we'll clear that, and then we're on to the next thing because guess what? Your brand name is not gonna make or break your business at this point. You're not you're not Apple, you're not Nike, you're not a de like, let's get you a brand name, let's make sure it's protectable, let's make sure it's registrable, and then let's move on to the next step. Like right. you've got to get started, you gotta take action, you gotta move. Um, and then as you're doing that and you grow and you scale, that's when you start to think, okay, now now I'm moving in the right direction. Who do I need on my team? Right. You know, who's, who's my go-to lawyer? Who's my go-to tax person? Who's my go-to branding person or, you know, whatever your team needs to be, but you know, people don't cost you money. Not right. having a ground can cost you a lot of money. Sure. Sure. And then you also inevitably, if something does happen, you at least have someone you can go to that you have a comfort level with. Ex so absolutely. That, no, like let's say all of a sudden you get like a, a, a letter, or as you mentioned earlier, registered agents, which is basically just your lawyer who's collecting your mail for you in case anything yeah. bad happens. So yeah. whether, if you get something at your registered agent, you need to pay attention to it. That's, that's the important stuff for sure. Yeah. yeah. So let's say, you know, you have a scary letter that's got lawyer letterhead on it and yep. it got all this wording that sounds threatening. Like yeah. what what's, what should be your next step? So when I, whenever I, I talk about cease and desist letters or just scary lawyer letters, I think you know, my first guidance is we'll take it for what it is. It's a letter, okay? Mm -hmm. It's certainly not something to be ignored, but it's, it's also not something to overreact to. Mm -hmm. um, a typical cease and desist letter is going to be very strong. It's going to accuse you of doing horrible things. It's going to cite statutory provisions that look really scary. Um, there may be demands for, we want to know how many sales you made. We want to you know who have you sold to, what's your supplier's name, like, you know, demand, 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 demand. At that point, it's just a letter. Like, right. I mean, there's no, there's been no legal judgment. There's been no, I mean, I can write a letter, you know, I mean, I have to have some degree of basis. You just don't want to go off scaring people because that can create liability itself, but it's a letter, right? Right. If it's, I think there's a real difference between a letter that is sent by a competitor that's not sent by their lawyer, right? That tells me, I can tell a lot by the letter, right? If it's just sent directly by the competitor and not their lawyer, not anyone in their legal department, that tells me that 
they're concerned about whatever they're claiming in the letter, but they're not hyper serious about it because they didn't pay a lawyer to send it, right? So that tells me something. If it's sent from a lawyer who's, you know, law firm, you know, it's an e-commerce related matter, but their law firm tends to do estate planning, that tells me that, okay, well, it's kind of serious and that a lawyer was involved, but, you know, this practice doesn't really seem to be focused on e-commerce and copyright infringement and trademark infringement. And so maybe this was just like a friend of the person that, you know, is, is complaining. Um, so again, not so serious. If I get a letter from a really big high powered law firm, that's super scary. And it's, it, that tells me, okay, it's a, it's a big brand with big power, uh, firepower. These folks are really hyper serious. I'm absolutely getting that in front of someone that knows how to read it and what it means and what it doesn't mean for a professional opinion. Um, frankly, you get a letter of any sort. I think it's worthwhile to get a professional opinion, but I think that to me, there's kind of degrees of scariness, right? On, on one end of the spectrum, there's, you know, fancy, fancy letterhead, nice linen paper, big high powered law firm letter. And then there's, I remember one letter that I, that I saw from a client. It was, you know, like HP printer paper that you'd buy down at the store. Um, it was written by another company, you know, their owner. It, it, it was clear they didn't know what they were talking about, not because they didn't know the law, but like it was really, it was a mix of, there were some copyright principles in it, some trademark principles, some pet. I mean, it was just kind of like spaghetti against the wall in the hopes that this letter kind of right. scared the client. I couldn't even figure out how to respond. My response for the client was, can you please help me exactly what you're concerned about? Cause I, I can't as nicely as I could, like, I can't right. tell what you're, I don't even know how to look at this. Like, you, you know, can you, can you help me here? Like, I don't think we're doing anything wrong, but I also don't know what you're alleging that we're doing. So please, can you send another letter? Uh, right. and we, it, it, I mean, we got it all resolved and we got it taken care of, but, um, there are degrees of scariness, I guess is what I'd say. So take it with a grain of salt. Don't ignore it. I uh, certainly don't. You know, a lot of people, are a little too flippant, I think, with, with cease and desist letters. And they're like, I got a letter. I'm just going to toss it aside. Well, don't do right. that. Have somebody look at it because someone at least at a minimum, even the worst of worst, poorly, most poorly written cease and desist letters, someone at least took the time to write it. So, you know, they're, they're a little bit concerned. Right. And whether it's cease and desist or it looks like a lawsuit or whatever the case is, someone's threatening something. One thing I've learned just in the business world in general is whatever's in their letter, is their request, even if they make it sound like a demand, they make it sound like they have legal justification, that's yeah. their opinion. So mm -hmm. before you say, oh, well, I'll write a check for 10 grand or whatever they're asking for, talk to someone. It goes talk back to somebody. To absolutely. don't cost money. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely don't do that. And just because someone sends you a letter saying, hey, tell me how many sales you've made, that doesn't mean you have to. Like, right. don't offer that up. Um, don't, don't, in, fr in fact, I wouldn't respond at all. Or if you do respond, literally the response is, thank you. I'm in receipt of, of your letter and I'm reviewing it with my counsel. I mean, I think that's kind of the best. If you absolutely can't not respond, that's the only response. I've mm -hmm. received the letter. I'm reviewing it with my attorney and, and, and then sign your name or sign off the email, however you want to do it. Right. Um, but don't, just because somebody asks you to do all sorts of things doesn't mean you have to do it. Right. And if they have a deadline date, that's really their deadline. It's not necessarily like grounded in legal. Um, now, of course, check with your lawyer. On yes. it, but but, if, but, it's a, but at that point, it's a letter, right? When right. courts give you deadlines, then you need to pay attention. When the patent and trademark right. office gives you a deadline, then yes. you need to pay attention. But Joe Schmo and, and Joe's lawyer giving you, sending you a letter and saying, if you don't respond in the next 48 hours, you know, hellfire and brimstone is going to rain down. Right. The well, you know, I hope that doesn't happen, but you know, I, I, 48 hours, I can't, I can't do anything in 48 hours. I'm, I'm sorry. And uh, yeah, they, best of luck. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, right. Do you, exactly. Sometimes those are just negotiation tactics. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yes. And again, it's, you have a position, they have a position, but just mm -hmm. because they have a strong position or they you know, articulated it well or not so well, doesn't mean yeah. that they're even right. So that's why you should go talk to that's why, that's why you need to, to talk to somebody that can, can actually look at what they're claiming, that can validate it or, or say, no, they really don't have a leg to stand on. This is really just kind of a shakedown and they're trying to scare you. Or right. 
you know what, this is, this is what they're ultimately trying to lead you into is not, you know, paying them money, but they want to coexist with your trademark. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different angles. And so somebody that, that is in the space that sees a lot of that will be able to give you, it would give you good guidance around right, right. what does this mean and what does it not, what does the letter not mean? Um, you know, but, but again, I think that those sorts of things highlight the importance of having the right people on your team, or at least a go to when those situations bubble up because they will, I mean, you know, that's just the nature of business. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Business is, uh, can be messy at times, but mm-hmm. you know, I, I love it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's a great thing. I mean, it, it's that great adventure. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I consistently yeah. marvel with the fact that, I mean, I have sold products across the globe. I mean, there are people in Germany running around with my products. Right. Never actually touched any of that inventory. I mean, I've seen samples obviously. And that's right, right, right. like, Business is, business is great. And the challenge of business and, and, and the struggle of growing and scaling and those learning pains and the, oh man, we forgot to do this. How do we fix it? Yeah, you know, on one hand, it, it's frustrating, but on the other hand, that's living and that's breathing. And that's, that's what makes it all worthwhile is kind of the struggle. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, I think the takeaways here, if I'm understanding this correct, and please, please correct me if I'm wrong, make sure you're your business is some sort of formal entity. Yes. Uh, make sure that you have registered your brand name or mm-hmm. s- some degree. And then mm-hmm. also if you ever do get any lawyer type um, letters that you mm-hmm. do speak to a professional and at some yeah. point you get a professional on your team, doesn't mean you have to pay $5,000 a month yeah. in retainer, but at least someone that you know you can call that you've at least has had some level of experience in dealing with you and your brand. Absolutely. hundred percent. And I think that's, you know, that last piece about doesn't have to cost $5,000 for retainer. You know, one of the, you know, just as the internet's kind of been the great equalizer in terms of like starting a business in the law, the practice of law is not what a lot of people think it, it of it, you know, based upon what they've seen on TV or what they've heard about. Like there, there's very much a movement within newer, younger law firms to kind of reinvent the profession. And so, yes, it would be lovely to just have, you know, thousand, you know, you know $5,000 monthly retainers or whatever. Like that's, there's a lot of different options out there for people that are looking for really solid legal guidance. And there's a lot of really alternative fee structures. The days of, oh, well, somebody's going to bill me $700 per hour. And every time their paralegal works on something, that's going to be $300. Mm-hmm. Like that does still exist. But, you know, if you're able to find, you know, newer, smarter kind of up and coming law firms, like they, they practice differently. And so just don't, right. don't assume that, well, that, you know, that lawyer is going to be too expensive or getting that work done is going to be too expensive. It may be, or it may not be. But what I'm saying is don't just, don't avoid going and speaking to a professional because you think it's going to be too expensive. I think you'll be surprised at what you find with, with most firms these days. And by the way, I shouldn't tell this because this is like, you know, lawyers disclosing their tricks. Fee negotiable. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if, you know, just because someone says, well, it's going to be, a thousand dollars. Well, you know, maybe, maybe you push them a little bit and it's not a thousand dollars or maybe they say, well, no, that's really what the rate is. And you know, see you later. Um, right. but, but I mean, that does, you know, it's, it's just like any other business. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. So if anyone wanted to get in contact with you or just check out more of what you um, sure. have, there, where would they find you? You, you could find me at counselinthecloud.com. That is counsel, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, not with the C, uh, counselinthecloud.com. And, you know, kind of my practice is, again, mostly 90% e-commerce sellers. But, you know, if you have needs with trademarks, copyrights, contract, website, terms of service sorts of things, or just scary letters in your business, certainly happy to, to chat with you. You can find me at counselinthecloud.com. Good deal. And, um, out of curiosity, where, if someone is based, can you help them? Uh, so if it's an intellectual property matter, kind of anywhere. Oh, um, nice. So I have a number, yeah, which is cool because it's federal law. Um, so I have clients that are throughout the United States. I have clients that are in Australia, New Zealand, throughout Europe, um, kind of across the globe. So it's a, it's a little bit of a global practice these days nice. um, around all sorts of e-commerce centric things. 
Well, good deal. Well, good deal. So yeah, I definitely recommend if you do have legal questions and you're not sure who to turn to, definitely uh, uh, give Robert consideration. Um, Robert, <laughs> my, uh, said dealings with him it makes it sound so formal but <laughs> it sounds very fishy yes talking to robert. robert is very forthcoming with information and uh he's a good guy so definitely check it out. It's kind well awesome well thank you so much for being here today robert oh well thank you i appreciate the opportunity and i uh, hope everyone enjoyed the uh, the conversation as much as i did and uh I'll, we'll, we'll listen to the next podcast with you awesome i did as well all right take care thanks Bye -bye.